99% of the words I'm going to ask you to read, just 1%. Can you? So read the words in yellow that are on the screen. It says, ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost will come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. In the New King James, it says that when the Holy Spirit comes, you will receive power. And after that, you will be witnesses, it says, locally, mm -hmm. regionally, that's Judea and Samaria. And it says that you, not just the people that Jesus was talking to then, but all of his church members will actually witness the people in the far-flung corners of the earth. Do you believe that? Amen. Do you believe that something that you can say or do can reach someone on the other side of the world? Yes. It's true. Yes. It's true. Let's see if we can get this to work. When we think of witnessing, we often think of knocking on doors and meeting new people and talking to them about the Lord. Or we think of giving a Bible study or um, street preaching. Or we think of um, maybe giving clothing or food to the poor or doing some kind of a health um, medical missionary thing. But what I want to talk to you about today is what I call the foundation of effective witnessing. The title of our message is the word 
of their testimony. And that comes from Revelation chapter 12 and verse 11. I'll read the words in white. I'd like you to read the words that are in color. It says, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of the testimony. And they Three components to this text. It talks about an omnipotent supernatural agency that breaks down every barrier and overcomes it. That's the blood of the Lamb. It talks about a personal weapon that God's people will employ in the last days, and it talks about a spiritual principle that you have to pray over every day. We're our, in our little Bible study this morning, we're going to look at the biblical context of this scripture. We'll talk about power in the blood. We'll talk about what the Bible says is the word of your testimony. And then we'll close by talking about this spiritual principle that I believe every Christian should pray over every day and then we're going to end with a church exercise where we're going to try to tell a little bit of our testimonies one-on-one -on -one here in church this morning when we look at revelation chapter 12 and verse 11 we often just look at it just like a dark thought against the board like it's just this one wonderful little text that's just in isolation but it is not a text in isolation you know that the job of a pastor or minister is to read books, meditate, talk to God, and then come back and talk to other people about it? Well, here's a book that you might never ever see, but I'm going to tell you just about a page in this book. The title of the book is Seventy Weeks Leviticus, Nature of Prophecy, and there's an article in there by the premier theologian in all of Adventism, in my opinion. His name is William Shea. And Dr. Shea wrote an article said, entitled, The Literary Form and Theological Function of Leviticus. What is all that about? I'm going to summarize it for you. In this lengthy article, he says, this is the paragraph, the literary form of a given portion of inspired scripture was designed to help explain its message. What does that mean? He says, the way that scripture is written, the pattern, the form of it, is telling you about its meaning. And in this passage, this article that he writes about Leviticus, he makes an observation which I believe, generally speaking, is true. And that observation is this. God puts the most important point where? In the middle, in the middle of the scripture. God puts the most important point in the middle. In this article, he's talking about Leviticus, and he makes this lengthy um, treatise about the Pentateuch. That's the first five books of the Bible. We call them the Book of the Law. You know, Joshua 1 a, this Book of the Law shall not depart out of thy mouth. That's talking about the first five books of the Bible. What are those first five books? Genesis, Exodus, and William Shea says, God put the most important book where? In the middle. And what's the book that's in the middle of the book of the law? Leviticus. There it is in the middle. Where's the middle book? Leviticus. He says, that's the most important book. And he says, if you look at the middle of Leviticus, you'll find the most important part. And Leviticus is 27 chapters. And the theological center of it is Leviticus 16. Why don't we talk about that? Because it's important for us in our study of Revelation 12, 11. God puts the, the, the key to understanding things, and in, in his structure of laying things out, he puts the key in the middle. Where does he put the key? In the middle. The most important key. He, not all the time, but most of the time, he puts a key right in the middle. He teaches this that in nature. If this was a Bible... Where is the sweetest spot of this fruit? Is it around the edge right here near the white rod? Where's the sweetest spot? Ah, oh, you guys know about that spot. <laughs> you know why it's sweetest in the middle? Because that's where the most minerals of the watermelon are. That's the most nutritious part, is the sweetest part. And God does that. He's trying to teach us something very important. The King James Version of the Bible has 31,173 verses in it. You can find that in HMS Richard's Special Subject Helps. Is that an even number or odd number? 
Odd That's odd number. That means that there's one scripture right in the middle of the whole Bible. And that scripture is, where is it? Where is it? Where is that scripture? Psalms 118. Psalms 118. Psalms 118.8 is the center scripture in all the Bible. The Bible has all kinds of stories about how Abraham trusted in his own ideas and took Hagar to get his wife and how David was supposed to go to war, but he didn't go to war. He stayed back and he got into trouble. And all of these stories are trying to teach us one important point. And that one important point is right in the center of the Bible. And what does it say in Psalms 118? They read it for me. It says, It is better to trust the Lord than to put confidence in men. The whole Bible can be summarized in one Bible text. And that Bible text is, It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. So God puts the key. Where does he put the key often? In the middle. Not all the time, but most of the time he puts the key right in the middle. There's a book in the Bible called the book of Daniel. It doesn't only apply to the Bible, it applies to books. It applies to chapters. And there's a book in the Bible called the book of Daniel, and it has 357 <laughs> verses in it. Is that an even number or odd number? That means that there's a text that's right in the what? Middle. The middle of the book of Daniel. Very interesting. Because if you understand this principle that the literary form helps to explain the meaning, and that the key is often in the middle, it will teach you to start looking for the middle of Scripture. It's not always the key there, but sometimes there is a key there. What is the book of Daniel about? It talks about all of these world powers that rise, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. And it talks about a remnant of people that stood against these world powers, that resisted their influence, and that God was with them. There was a remnant of people there. And it even goes on and talks about other powers represented as beasts and little horns rising up and persecuting and trying to, to think to change God's times and law. And the end of Daniel talks about a time of trouble such as never was. But do you know what text is right in the middle of the book of Daniel? Daniel has 12 chapters. And the middle of scripture is in Daniel chapter 6. In verse 11, but you have to add verse 10 to understand verse 11. Daniel chapter 6 and verse 10 says, Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and the windows being opened in his chamber towards Jerusalem, what does it say there in yellow? He kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done before time in the middle scripture in all of the Bible says that in all of Daniel the whole book of Daniel the middle scripture in all of the book of Daniel is Daniel 6 11 that says that the men assembled and they what? Did it say they're in yellow? and found Daniel praying that when the test came if you want to, if you want to be the remnant that when all these world powers rise, when all the persecution comes, when all the time of trouble comes, you want to be that remnant that stands, this is the key. The key is three times a day, yes. making your communion with God, right. no matter what the laws say, no matter what the inconvenience, so that when the people assemble to look, they will find you praying. Amen. That's at the center of the book of Daniel, Daniel 6 and verse 11, which brings us to another book. What book is that? Revelation. The book of Revelation. Book of Revelation? We're going someplace, brothers and sisters. <laughs> We're going someplace. We're going to try to get to Revelation 12, 11. And the book of Revelation talks about a lot of different things. It talks about seven churches that start out pure and then persecuted and then they become pagan and they start going down and they become lukewarm in the end. It talks about um, a beast that rises out of the bottomless pit, a scarlet colored beast that reigned during the French Revolution. It talks about a, oops, I'm sorry, a leopard-like beast whom, that represents the papacy throughout the dark age. It talks about a lamb-like beast. It talks about Babylon the Great and all of these powers that are warring. And in the book of Revelation, God said, I have a key for you. Because the form helps to explain the meaning of the text. And where does God often put the key? In the middle. In the middle. And where is the middle 
of the book of Revelation. Does anybody want to venture a guess? What chapter would you say? Eight. What are we studying today? What chapter are we studying today? What verse? Twelve. <laughs> That's correct. There are 404 verses in the book of Revelation. And right in the middle of the book, there are five scriptures, five verses. One, two, three, four, five. Five scriptures that are that tell a little story right in the middle of the book of Revelation. Here's the five scriptures. Starts at verse 7 of Revelation 12, and it ends with the scripture that we're studying. The scripture that we're studying, Revelation 12, 11, is an important scripture. It's one of the keys you need to have if you're going to be the church that doesn't become, the person that doesn't become lukewarm, if you're going to be the person that stands against the beast out of the bottomless pit, if you're going to be the person that stands against the leopard-like beast, that stands against the mark of the beast, then you have to understand these scriptures right here, right at the middle, because God has put a key right in the middle of the book of Revelation. Before we can look at those scriptures, we're going to run through the first four of them quickly and get to the climax, which is verse 11. But before we can look at them, I have to explain something. Revelation is not an ordinary book. You know, I used to work in prison as a correction officer, and I did Bible studies in prison. And the very first time I met with all the inmates at the Bible, I said, what do you guys want to study? They said, we want to study the mark of the beast. <laughs> I was like, oh, no. I was like, are you sure? He said, that's what we want to study. Now, there's nothing wrong with studying the mark of the beast. There's nothing wrong with it. But you have to study some other things first. Don't let anybody tell you that the first thing you can tell people the first time you see him is the mark of the beast. We have how many messages in Revelation 14? Three. First, second, and third. And you're supposed to start with the first. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Amen. So when people say they want to study, study Revelation first, I have a little anxiety about yeah. that. <laughs> Brother Steve, what are you talking about? Why do you have anxiety? Re number one, Revelation is not written like any other book in the Bible. It says in Revelation 1 and verse 1 that an angel signified it to John. That means he gave it to John in signs. He gave it to John in symbols. The book was written in symbols. It talks about a beast that has seven heads, brothers and sisters. There's no animal in nature with seven heads. It's a symbol of something. It talks about dragons. There are no such things as dragons. It's a symbol of something. And how can you understand those symbols? You have to understand the things written before the book of Revelation. Revelation is a different book in the sense that it spans a great scope of history. In Revelation 1, it starts with a picture of Jesus as our high priest. And in Revelation 19, it's Jesus coming the second time. That's 2,000 years in Earth's history and 22 chapters. So the book of Revelation is, and it even talks about after the 1,000 years in Revelation 20. So the book of Revelation is covering a long period of time in 22 chapters. What does that mean? It means that Revelation has to do what? Skip some details. I want you to get this because we're going to go to Revelation 12 and you're going to see it. That it's going to start talking about things and it's going to start skipping along and you have to understand that before you can understand Revelation 12 in verse 11. All right, you Bible scholars. Where is Revelation found in the canon of Scripture? Where is it found among the books of the Bible? The Where is it found in the New Testament? At the end. At when? The beginning or the end? end? Is Revelation at the beginning of the Bible or the end of the Bible? End. That's an easy question. Here's a harder question. Why is it at the end of the Bible? Because it's reviewing stuff. Because Why? it's talking about the future. Why? But you could talk about the future early. Why is it at the end? I'm going to take a start and say it's a summary. It's a summary? <laughs> Okay, all right, let me help you a little bit. Here's Revelation here at the end. Let's say it was put here in front of Matthew. So it's the first, say it was the first book in the New Testament. What would, 
What challenge would that create? There's no definition or example, explanation of the symbolic meaning. That's correct. Revelation chapter 4 talks about a lamb that was slain, but you wouldn't even know who the lamb was if you've not read Matthew. If Revelation was put here, right at the start of, before Genesis, the very first book in the Bible, when you got to Revelation 7 and it talks about people being sealed after Joseph and after the name of Issachar and um, Zebulun and 12,000 sealed under the name of Judah, you wouldn't know who those people were. I go back to my question. So why is Revelation at the end of the Bible? Because it's harder to understand in other books. It, it will be very difficult to understand unless you have read what? All, yes. All the other books of the Bible. You cannot understand Revelation just by reading Revelation. You've got to start in Genesis and work your way to the end of the Bible. Does that make sense? Yes. It's 100% it's true. I've tried to start studying people and try to study Revelation with them who don't know anything about the Bible, and they're just drawing a blank, drawing a blank, drawing a blank, because they don't know about the things that I'm talking about, because they didn't start at the beginning. All right, so Revelation is a book that's written in symbols. It's put, in that, it's put at the end of the Bible because it um, requires a quite a a large amount of basic information to be mastered in order to understand it, to be able to explain those symbols. But Revelation, just like other places of the Bible, its literary form help us to understand the meaning of the scripture. And God has put an important key to understanding the book. And where would that key be found? In the middle of the book of Revelation. And that's the five texts that we've come to now. We're doing good with time. Um, we're, going to, we're going to get out. This is going to be one of the shortest sermons ever preached mm. by John Ski in this church. It. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> right. So here we go. We're in Revelation 12, 11. Here we are. We've got to our text already. And these five texts are in the middle of the book of Revelation. And it begins at verse 7. It says, and there was what? War. War. In heaven, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon fought at his angels. And what? Prevailed not. Neither was their place found anymore in heaven. Stop. Screech. Right there. Stop right there. Verse 8 is the 202nd verse in the book of Revelation. Between 8 and 9 is the center of the book of Revelation. And right at the beginning of this little passage, right in the center... God talks about a great cosmic battle, an unseen battle between Christ and Satan. And it says that Satan prevailed not. Say amen. amen. He didn't win. He lost. Amen. And the next phrase says, neither was there place found anymore in heaven. That's telling us a little bit about God. God is all powerful. He's all wise. He defeated Satan. And when he defeated Satan, he says, you got to go. Says, I'm not going anywhere. The Bible says there was war in heaven. And God and the Bible, did, just, God didn't say, well, you just go in that little corner over there and you stay over there. It says, neither was there place found anymore in heaven. Yes. You got to go. 100% got to go. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you something, friends. When you're trying to reform your life and you got these movies that you're throwing out, you can't say, well, I'm just going to keep this one. It has some cuss words in it, but it's, it's, I really like the story. They all got to go. Amen. When you're trying to clean up your diet, you can say, well, I'm just going to keep this little ice cream in the freezer because yeah. this ice cream is good. Now. It's got to go what? 100%. When God deals with something, he says, neither is their place found anymore. In Revelation 12, 11, we're coming to, it's a, it's a warfare text. And he's trying to teach us that the principle of the warfare is when you get into this war, it's 100% all the way through. It's all or nothing. Because that's how God does things. He doesn't let Satan keep a little corner. And you can't allow Satan to have a little corner of your heart, a little corner of your home, a little corner of your property. He's got to go 100%. Amen? So there was war in heaven. 
And I want you to see that Satan didn't win the Great War. But catch this. He won some minor skirmishes. Because the Bible says Michael and his angels fought and the dragon fought. What's the next phrase? And his angels. What does that mean? What does that mean? That means that he did win some. He did, he did win some. All right, we're ready to move on. Verse 8. Verse 9, excuse me. And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Those are the first three verses of our five-verse passage. And I want you to notice something very important. That at the very center of Revelation, God does something very unusual. He describes pain. <laughs> He likes that word. He likes that word. <laughs> he heard that word. He ran up. He said, word of God being preached. <laughs> at the beginning, at the beginning, <laughs> you got to be confused here. <laughs> at the middle of this passage, God does something very unusual. He describes the enemy with four different phrases. Watch this now. Watch this. Satan is called four different things. And each one of those things tells us a little bit of his character and method of warfare. Nice. Dragon means, we'll start at the bottom. Satan means opposer or adversary. Satan means someone who opposes. You can read Zechariah 3 verse 1. It says that Satan was there against the high priest to resist him. That's what he does. The word devil means, if you look it up in the Greek, it means false, false accuser. accuser. You're making charges against somebody. It also means a betrayer. In uh, John chapter 5 and verse 70, it says, Jesus says, I call 12, and it's not one of you, one of them a devil. Who was he talking about? Judas. 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 And what did Judas do? He, he pretended to be one of the disciples, but, but secretly he was behind the scene betraying. So one of the methods of saying he's going to oppose, he's going to accuse, he's going to betray. He's, in this passage, he's called that old serpent. It says old serpent to take your mind back to Genesis 3, which means, and that's talking about Satan as a what? Deceiver. Deceiver. Like deceiver. Uh -huh. And dragon um, refers to Jesus, uh, Satan excuse me, as a persecutor. I took the text out because I wanted to have less um, slides in the slide program, but Revelation 12, 13 says, that when the dragon was cast out into the earth, he persecuted the woman. That's talking about force. That's talking about death and murder and killing. And these are the four methods by which Satan works. He opposes, he resists every step. He makes false accusations. He lies and deceives. And he uses force to get his way. Right. So in the warfare in heaven, all of those things were used. And in his warfare on earth, all of these things are used. And if you're trying to teach people revelation, there is a work of exposing Satan. There's a work of doing what? Exposing Satan. It's right there in the middle. He put it in the middle. He said, listen, you need to expose Satan and expose all of his methods of working. Expose all of his methods of working. So don't let people tell you that there's no work of expose. There is a work of expose. Right. But it can't be just expose. You have to tell them how to overcome. Right. And they overcome by the power of the Lamb and the word of their testament. You have to move beyond expose. If you just stop with expose, you haven't helped them. Because the only saving part of our message is Jesus. If you don't have Jesus, I don't care what else you have, you're not going to heaven. You didn't catch what I just said. If you don't have Jesus, you can separate from this church, that church, that alcohol group, all that. You're still going to hell. You've got to have Jesus come into your heart, take over your life, and become the king of your whole experience in order to be saved. So you've got to talk about expose in the, in the beginning because Satan is working to destroy people. We have to expose him. Great Controversy, page 516. Great Controversy, page 516. There is nothing that the great deceiver fears so much 
is that we will become acquainted with his devices. It says there's nothing Satan fears. Then he's starting to be exposed. He's an adversary, a false accuser, a deceiver. He doesn't want you to read Revelation to know that he's going to do all these things. I was talking with a young man recently, and he told me, I'm no longer Seventh-day Adventist. He said, I, 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 I celebrate voodoo now. Oh, wow. He says, I practice voodoo. And I told him, I said, I said, young man, Satan is not your friend. You think that he's your friend, that he's going to bless you. But the Bible teaches he kills his own. His worshipers, he had them burn their children. And you can play with them if you want to. But it won't end well. Your car's going to run out of road. It's going to have a bad ending. And I encourage you to reconsider the course that you're on. Let's move on. Revelation 12, verse 9 says, He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Here's a question for you. What did Satan do when he was cast out into the earth? The next text in our scripture is Revelation 12 and verse 10. And Revelation 12 and verse 10 is talking about Calvary. When Satan was cast out of heaven into the earth, he was here for 4,000 years before Calvary. What was he doing for those 4,000 years? Plotting. Okay. okay, huh? Plotting. Okay, let me, uh, let me just back this up, make this a little easier. What was he doing in heaven before he was cast out? Yeah, who was he warring against? God. Warring against the government of God. Michael and his, angels. and his angels. So you could say warring against God and the heavenly family. When he was cast out in the earth, what did he continue doing? He was now warring against God and the okay. earthly family. For 4,000 years, hmm. when between him being cast out and Calvary, he was doing the same thing that he had done in heaven. He was warring against the family on earth. So here it is, Revelation 12, 79, we just read that, war in heaven. The very next text, it skips 4,000 years, and it goes to Calvary, Revelation 12, 10. I'll, I'll prove that for you, I'll show it to you in the Bible. And then it's going to skip some time, and it's going to go to some people that are going to be standing firm near the end of time, and they have some weapons that they're using. Okay? Here is what the slide that I thought I was going to come to next. This is Satan for 4,000 years warring against the earthly God and his earthly family. And we know that it started with him um, dis, um, opposing Eve and Adam, deceiving Eve. Adam wasn't deceived. He made a conscious choice. We know in Job chapter 1 and Job chapter 2, that, that when the sons of God assembled before God, that he presented himself as a representative of this earth. And what did he do? He accused God. He said, hey. And God said, have you considered my servant Job? And he said, ah, yeah. He served him because you're paying him to serve you. And he made some accusations. And we know that in Genesis 4, early in this earth's history, what are we seeing? We're seeing all of the same traits of character, the same methods of working that he used in the heavenly Warfare, he's now using in the earthly warfare. And we know in Genesis 4, who killed who? Cain. Cain. And um, what do you know about Cain? He was From jealous. Genesis 4. What do you know about him when he came to worship? What did he bring? He brought food. And what did Abel bring? A lamb. And the Bible says that God had respect to Abel's offering, but he did not have respect to Cain's offering. Brothers and sisters, I took the slide out. Brothers and sisters, that story of Cain and Abel, there's two great classes of Christians. Some that worship without the blood and others that worship with the blood. And we're coming to Revelation 12, 11. It says that this company, it, they overcame by the blood of the Lamb. And, and this story here, I, I had several slides and I took Three hours to make these slides, and this morning I stripped them all out. I was there talking with my wife, and she's like, honey, that's too much. <laughs> she said, that's too much, baby, that's too much, you're going to go long. So I stripped all the slides out. But in this story here, what did Cain end up with? Because he, after he was cursed, he says, any man that finds me will kill me. What did God say? Put a mark on you. I'm going to put a mark on you. 
that whoever finds you won't kill you. In the last day, there's another mark that's coming, and it's the people that are practicing their religion with no referral to the blood of Christ. They're not taking the power of the blood. They're going to get the mark. And they could be in any church. If you're not bringing the blood of Christ into your prayers, you're on the wrong path. And this man hated his brother. The Bible says in 1 John 3, verse 12, because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. When you have the blood, you have righteousness. You have, a, you have a new life, a new power to obey. You can't obey of yourself, brothers and sisters. You can't obey of yourself. You've got to have the blood. You've got to have the what? The blood. You've got to have the blood. Let's move on. For 4,000 years, a warfare was going on. And God was working through his people. In Genesis 3, when Moses was up on the mount, he said, for the first time, God said, I am the God of Abraham. Who? Isaac. Isaac. And who? Jacob. Jacob. Why did God use those three men? It's because these three men represented the experience of every Christian. They have to have faith. They have to have, what did it say there? A miracle birth. A miracle birth because you remember when Isaac was born, his mother was beyond the childbearing years. It was a miracle. And Jacob was the one that wrestled with God. And he prevailed, he overcame, and his name was changed from Jacob to Israel because it says, as a prince that has power with God. And so these are the three experiences that every Christian has to have. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob represents that we have to be, have what? Faith. Faith. We have to have the what? Overcome. And we have to become what? Overcome. Overcomers. So that's 4,000 years of Earth's history, all in four slides. Which brings <laughs> us to Revelation 12 in verse 10. Read the words in yellow and pink for me. It says, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ for the accuser of our brothers which accused them before our God day and night. This was what was proclaimed in heaven at the split second that Jesus died on the cross. On the cross. It was proclaimed in heaven with a loud voice. Now is come salvation and strength. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down. Brother Skeet, how do you know that that was proclaimed at the moment that Jesus died on the cross? How do we know that Revelation 12 and verse 10 is talking about Calvary? Here it is. Here's my Bible proof. John chapter 12. Stay with me. We're, going, we're coming to the climax of our study. Hold on. Don't, don't go to sleep on me. In John chapter 12, before Jesus went to the cross, he said something very interesting. He said, what's the very first word? Now. He said, now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be what? Cast out. And then he said, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me, this he said, signifying what? What does it say there? Death. Death. Which is he should die. So Jesus said before he died that he was going to be lifted up on the cross, that that's how he was going to die, and, he, and that when he was lifted up, that that's when this world would be judged and Satan would be cast out. That's the Bible proof right there. And in another passage, Jesus actually foresaw what would actually happen when he died on the cross. And he described it to his disciples. And he said unto them, I beheld, what did it say? They read it for me. Satan has what? Fall from heaven. When Jesus died on the cross, Satan was flung from heaven down to this earth, never to return to heaven again. But this key, what are you talking about? Here it is. Zyre Vegas 761. It quotes Revelation 12.10. Heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Now is salvation and strength. And this is what it says. It says, Satan saw, when he killed Christ on the cross, Satan saw that his disguise was torn away. His administration was laid open before the unfallen angels and before the heavenly universe. He had revealed himself as a murderer. murderer. By shedding the blood of the Son of God, he had uprooted himself from the sympathies of the heavenly beings. And at that moment, and it goes on to say, I took the statement out because it's too long. It says that he could no longer return to the courts of heaven and present himself 
in the courts of heaven. He was flung from heaven. He was cast down at that time. And that victory that Jesus got on the cross, where he poured out his life, because the blood represents a life poured out. That victory he offers to us, and we have finally come to the climax of our study. We have about 12 slides left. Just hold on. Revelation 12 and verse 11, it says, And they overcame him. Who's the him? Right. Right. By the blood of the Lamb. The blood of the Lamb is the omnipotent divine agency by which every victory is gained. Amen. Jesus' blood provides power to get victory over anything Satan can bring up. Amen. And Calvary proves that all of our prayer options are open. Here it is, Romans 8. It says, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us what? All things. So it's saying in that Bible text, if the father said, I'm giving up my son to die, if he's willing to do that, the father says, so if there's anything else you need, I'll freely give it to you. Because I've given up the most valuable thing to me. Amen. So if there's anything else you need, I'll give it to you. How does that work? How can we understand that? Where do we have to go? Thy way, O God, is where? We always quote that verse, but I want you to catch the next verse. Verse 14. It says, Thou art the God that does what? Who is wonders. Thou hast declared thy strength among thy people. The sanctuary is going to produce a people that do wonders, that have strength, that will overcome. How does it work? Very simply. The sacrifice represents Jesus, a sacrificial animal, gives up their life, and that provides the blood. That blood is then ministered by the priest on behalf of the prayer of the sinner. But the speech, I don't understand what you just said. Here it is again. The death of the sacrifice provides the blood that the priest ministers to answer the prayer of who? The sinner. So when the sinner says, I want forgiveness, the priest goes into the sanctuary and he takes the blood and he says, Father, hear their prayer because of the blood I shed on the cross. Amen. And when the priest ministers the blood, the Father says, that prayer is answered, that prayer is heard. So, what, so the blood provides the authority for that prayer to be answered. Did you catch that? When they ministered blood in the sanctuary, was blood just splashed in the old place? It wasn't. It had to be applied. What was that the last word there? It has to be applied how? Remember the Passover? Could they just put the blood on the ground or on the wall? How where'd the blood have to go in the Passover? The door stand. On the side post and the the lintel. Is that correct? The side post, that's the crossbar. Lentils dripping down, it makes a cross. It had to be placed in, a, in the right place. Brothers and sisters, we talked about, this. Revelation 12, 11 says, and they overcame by the blood of the lamb. What is that talking about? It's saying that in your prayer life, you have to apply the blood to specific situations that you're warring against. If you look up on the internet um, the, um, the blood of Christ in the world of salvation, you'll get a bunch of pictures like this. Our home is covered by the blood of Jesus. <laughs> Amen. You'll get scriptures like this. Your, our neighborhood is covered by the blood of Jesus. You can just pray like this. Lord, cover the whole world with your blood. That's not how it works. It, the blood has to be applied to, what does it say here? Specific it has to be prayed over. What does it say here? Specific people. Specific people in what? Specific situations. Specific situations. You have to pray and say, Oh Lord, let the blood of Jesus awaken my son to see himself as you see him and turn away from that alcohol. You have to... 
pray the blood for a specific person in a specific situation. Brothers, I don't think you made that up. Here it is in the spirit of prophecy. We're going to see Jesus doing it. We're going to see who doing it? Jesus. Jesus doing it. This is the book of early writings. The blood accompanies a specific prayer. It says, I saw four angels who had a work to do on the earth and were on their way to accomplish it. Jesus was clothed with the priestly garments. He gazed in pity on the remnant, then raised his hands, and with a voice of deep pity cried, what? My, my blood. blood. Father, my, my, my blood. How many times is that? Three. Back it up. Four. 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 Once, twice, three times, oh, four. four times. Then I saw an exceeding bright light come from God and sat upon the great white throne and was shed all about Jesus. Then I saw an angel from a what? What does it say there in yellow? Commission. So what does it mean? Jesus, come. he's saying, my blood, my blood, my blood. And he says to this angel, you, go and talk to those four angels. It's, bl it's blood with a specific mission. And the angel flies swiftly to the four angels who had a work to do on the earth and weighed something down in his hand. And what did the angel say? Oh, 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 oh. How many times? Four times? How many times was the blood invoked? Four times. He, just, he invokes the blood. He, prays, he says the angel on a mission. He says, do it as many times as I invoke my blood. Mm -hmm. And he said, do it until the servants of God are still in the forehead. We've come to the close of our study. What is the word of their testimony? Tell that, to answer that question, we just have to go to two stories in the Bible. Mark chapter 5. I'm not going to read the whole story. You know the story of Mark 5. Jesus crosses the sea because there's a man, one man or two men, possessed with demons. And they're naked, they're chains, the chains have been broke off of them. And they come, when comes the Bible says, and worship before Jesus. His disciples flee, but Jesus stands there. And um, the man is... Um, writhing and he's um, in agony and um, Jesus says what is your name and they says what we well we are many and they beseech, beseech Jesus that they can go into the into the swine that are on the on the side there and um, that Jesus gives them bid and the demons leave this person and they go into the swine they plunge over the cliff and are destroyed and the people were very upset about that they asked for Jesus to leave their countryside they had lost a lot of money and the Bible says that when Jesus was come to this ship he had crossed the ship just to deliver this person he did nothing else before he left he came in a ship now he's leaving in a ship and when he's about to leave the man possessed with the devil prayed that he might be with him and there's the text you've read it many times Albeit Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends and tell them what? How great the Lord hath done for thee, and hath had compassion on thee. What is the word of your testimony? The word of your testimony is telling what Jesus has done for you. It's not telling a whole lot of detail about what you were doing before Jesus <laughs> delivers you. Amen. Did you catch that part? Amen. People seem to miss that part. I had a, a slide I was going to put in here, and it showed me at an early time in my life. And after I thought about it, I said, mm, I better not put that on the screen. Amen. It's too much information. Because it was not at a time when I was coming to Christ. Mm -hmm. So that's not part of my story of coming to Christ. Did you catch that? Yes. That's not part of my story of coming to Christ. That's right. So we're going to about to do an exercise in about five minutes, and we're going to ask you to tell your testimony to someone here in the church, just for three or four minutes, and we don't want you to tell a whole lot about what you were doing before you came to Christ. Why? Because Jesus told the demoniac to tell them how great things the Lord had done for him and had compassion. That's where, that's where the testimony begins. And in um, Desire of Ages, it's beautiful. I can't read it all. But it says that these men that were restored, it says not one sermon from Jesus' lips have they ever heard.
but they could tell what they knew, what they themselves had seen, heard, and felt of the power of Christ. This is what everyone can do. As witnesses for Christ, we are to tell what we know. What we have, what does it say here? Seen and heard and felt. felt. This is the witness for which the Lord calls. You can tell somebody, I can tell somebody that I used to cuss like crazy, but I don't cuss anymore. Because God took it out of my heart and out of my mouth. Amen. And they can argue with all kinds of stuff, but I know what's true. And I can tell people what I know, what I've seen, what I've heard, what I've felt. Here's an example, beautiful example in the Bible, the last example before we close. And it says, there was a man who was born blind. Remember that story? Yeah. He was born blind and he, the, the Pharisee, he was healed by Jesus. And the Pharisees were angry because they said that Jesus was a false teacher. He was a sinner. And they tried to get his parents to testify. And his parents said, he's of age. Ask him. And then they asked him. It says, they said, give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. And he answered and said, whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. Let's say they're in pink. One thing I know. That, what does it say in yellow? Whereas I was born, I now see. That was his testimony. Amen. He said, look, I can't tell you all these theological things. But I can tell you this. I used to be blind. But you're wearing red, green, black, yellow, and polka dot over there. Okay? And, 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 and I can see now. That's right. And they couldn't argue with that. Amen. And that's the testimony. That's the word of your testimony. In all the witnessing that you do, somewhere in your witnessing, you need to get to your testimony. Amen. And to be able to tell it, listen to what I'm saying, carefully and prayerfully. Hmm, you didn't catch what I just said. You have to tell your testimony. What two words did I use? You can't just say any old thing that you used to do. It has to be careful and prevalent. Last thing that we want to talk about is the last phrase of Revelation 12 and verse 11. And in Revelation, it talks about all of these false doctrines. But the last phrase of Revelation 12, 11 is something that we need to learn. It's a guiding principle. You have to pray over this every day. You have to pray that God would teach you that you may learn how to love not your life Come on now. unto the death. Mercy. The last principle in Revelation 12, 11, that's right in the center of the book of Revelation, is every day we have to pray, say, Lord, teach me not to love my own opinion, not have to get my own way, not have Wendy fix what I want to eat for breakfast. <laughs> That I need to put myself last and other people first. And I need to pray over this principle how often? Every day. Every day. And if you start praying that you will learn how to love not your own life, your whole experience will radically change. That's what the mindset Jesus had. The Bible says he made himself of no reputation. He became a servant. He humbled himself. And it says, he became obedient unto death. In other words, he became so obedient, for when it led to his death, he said, I'm willing to die. That's the same attitude that John the Baptist had. Read it. How did, this is, he, he describes the same principle in one phrase. How did he describe it? He must increase. He must increase, but I must decrease. You have to pray that every day. That you'll love not your own life, but that you'll live Jesus' life every day. Every day. Lord, that there be less of me. My wife got up in the morning. She says, what do you want for breakfast? I say, whatever you want, sweetheart. She's like, no, 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 no. Do you want grits or you want oatmeal? I say, do you want grits or oatmeal? <laughs> she says, why would you just tell me what you want? Because I said, because I want you to fix what you want to eat. And I'll be happy with it. She says, you don't like oatmeal. I'll like it today. <laughs> we we got to start living in a way where it's not about pleasing ourselves. We got to start saying, Lord, let me not be about me. Let me live for someone else. And then you'll have a testimony. We've come to the end of our slide program this morning. 
We're going to do an exercise right now, an exercise in witnessing. Um, we've studied that at the very middle of the book of Revelation, there was a war in heaven. Satan was exposed as a opposer, as an accuser, as a persecutor, as a deceiver. And then a wonderful victory on the cross translated and making blood available for people to overcome Satan by praying the blood on specific people in specific situations and telling their own testimony. And so now I would like for you just to pair off with someone, if you're a woman, pair off with a woman, if you're a man, pair off with a man. And I'm going to ask you to tell just three or four minutes of your testimony of how you came to Christ. Not emphasizing too much of what happened before, but actually explaining how the transition came about. So can you break off into pairs at this time? Ladies, young men, older men, 